Good evening, everyone, and we are going to get started. This evening, we're talking about organic gardening. My name is Adam Watson. I'm one of the UT Extension agriculture agents in Washington County. And so I actually come uh, to this position with a background in organic agriculture. Uh, for four and a half years, I actually managed an organic certifier. That's the entity that actually certifies that farms that are selling uh, organic products or other processors are actually doing uh, what they're supposed to do to be able to earn that organic label that you see displayed on your slide there. So I've got uh, quite a bit of history with organic. And so it's something I'm always happy to talk about. Um, I will mention during this presentation, there may be trade or brand names that are mentioned. Just understand that's not to imply any sort of endorsement of myself or the university. It's just a way for us to have clarity as we're having this conversation. And of course, we always like to mention because there will be some pest control uh, products mentioned uh, as well as just strategies. Make sure you always read and follow all pesticide label directions. Uh, those are the law, so to speak. And so what it allows us to do, we can, and what it prevents us from doing, we cannot. So just make sure you're familiar with that. And so jumping right into it, if you're not real familiar with what really organic agricultural uh, agriculture is, uh, probably the best place to start is actually how it's defined by the United States Department of Agriculture, because organic is actually a label claim. It's a labeling term. And what it specifically says is that the product that you're looking at that is organic has actually been produced according to uh, approved methods. Those methods integrate cultural, biological, and mechanical practices that foster cycling of resources, promote ecological balance, and conserve biodiversity. And so there's actually a whole set of federal regulations, uh, Chapter 7, Section 205, if you're ever interested, readily available on the internet. There's a lot of specifics in there, things that you may do, things that you must do, things that you cannot do. And all those come together uh, to be what organic is at least from a legal sense. Uh, in truth, I think a lot of people have different definitions of organic. And that's why we kind of fall back to this certified organic definition uh, and even the requirements of the regulation because it allows us at least to have a base point to build from where we're all on the same page. I think one of the challenges that happens on this conversation is what about the other labels that are out there? And you may have seen these on any number of different sort of products. Uh, but for instance, natural doesn't really have a legal definition. So one product may say natural uh, and it may be almost synonymous with organic or it may not. And the simple question is who is verifying it? Is it being verified at all? Uh, another label you'll sometimes see is chemical free. Uh, this is one that the science nerd in me kind of scratches my head. Uh, if something is chemical free, I'm pretty sure it can exist because even water uh, is a chemical, so to speak. Um, but again, what does that really mean? There's not a clear definition. There certainly isn't a, a verification step behind that. So I think certainly that's what's good about organics. We do have that firm foundation to build from. And I think when we have these other labels that don't have that legal definition, that doesn't have the verification, that's where it's kind of buyer beware because you have to know the source, the company, the processor, the farmer even, uh, to be certain that what you're seeing is uh, truly uh, what you intend for it to be. So to me, the basis of organic agriculture, the theory behind it is very much summed up in that latter part of that sort of defining statement. It's that fostering uh, the cycling of resources, promoting ecological balance, and conserving biodiversity. All of those come together. And one of the things to understand is there are sort of broad um, exclusions to organic agriculture with some slight allowances. And we'll touch on at least some of these later on, but the basic generality of organic production and organic agriculture is no synthetic inputs. So this would mean, uh, and when I say inputs, it's all the things that go into growing, uh, whether we're talking about crops or even in organic agriculture animals, although we're focusing tonight on vegetable gardens, but things like fertility products, 
pesticide control products, uh, potting soils even. What are the ingredients in a potting soil, for instance? Uh, things like that, no synthetic inputs directly allowed. There's also the big prohibition of no sewage sludge, no products uh, that are derived from irradiation or genetic engineering. So this is one sometimes people are looking for a way to avoid uh, consuming or utilizing uh, genetically modified organisms. Uh, the organic agriculture label by definition cannot include genetic engineering. So that is one option for folks who may uh, be seeking those products. But a key to understand about organic agriculture is it's really a systems approach. Um, and what I mean by that, sometimes people come to organic with the concept that, well, it's the avoidance of all inputs. We're just going to plant things out and what happens, happens. In truth, uh, that's not going to go really well. Uh, it's very rare that we can reliably produce uh, any sort of yield, whether in a home garden or even in a commercial setting, if we're not taking steps in organic agriculture to make sure we have sufficient fertility, and even if we're not using pesticides uh, as needed. Uh, and certainly, uh, we'll talk some this evening about ways we can minimize perhaps both of those, uh, but certainly organic agriculture is not the failure or, or the intention to not use any sort of input products. It's also not just simply the avoidance of using conventional agricultural chemicals. Um, there's more to it because it is that systems approach. So it's not just looking at uh, perhaps substituting. Sometimes people think, well, you know, I'm familiar with conventional agriculture and the products associated with it. So I'll just substitute in the organic versions uh, for those products. But it's more than that. It's looking at creating a system that supports the goal of fostering those resources, et cetera. And the way that system is probably best explained in my mind is to look at it sort of in three parts. Uh, the first would be healthy soils. The second would be healthy plants. And the last would be talking some about integrated pest management. Big phrase, you may have seen it if you've uh, looked through conventional agricultural stuff, uh, because it's certainly valid there as well. But kind of looking at these three areas is going to give us an opportunity to look at how we can integrate organic gardening into our own home vegetable gardens. So starting with healthy soils, and I do want to say soils because it's not dirt. Um, one of the things is soils are alive, and that's really key and important to having a healthy soil. So yes, a healthy soil, I think it would be uh, the same thing as saying it must be productive. So that means it has sufficient fertility uh, to provide nutrients for production. One of the things that's important to understand about soils too is they can become compacted. So we need adequate pore space. As odd as it sounds, we need empty space in that soil because that's where water and air both reside in soil. And water and air are both critical to plants. Water, most people understand. But for instance, air has to be there as well. The roots need oxygen and when we get compacted soils and insufficient oxygen flowing to that root zone, we actually get root death. And obviously if we don't have good roots on a plant, we're not going to have healthy plants. And certainly a key of healthy soils is the microbiological community. Uh, this is a number of different organisms. It's bacteria, it's fungi, it's higher order uh, little critters. Um, and they're all important because what happens in that soil is the cycling of nutrients. Uh, so we have decomposers active. Uh, they consume nutrients, they die, then they release them. Uh, there's other organisms that form symbiotic relationships with plants. So one that a lot of plant folks are familiar with is Rhizoctonia bacteria and legume plants. And that's the bacteria that allows those plants to actually fix nitrogen from the air so that they provide nitrogen directly to the plant through that symbiotic relationship. There's also fungal symbiotic relationships that are basically greatly increase the volume of soil that the uh, plant roots are able to draw nutrients from. Uh, and so it, it's a complex uh, system and ecosystem there uh, that we can certainly uh, do everything possible to have the most robust uh, ecosystem. 
One of the other things that I, th I think is important is when we have these active biological communities there, at least to some level, that can actually deny the opportunity for certain predatory microbes to take residence. Uh, so, you know, there's only so many niches or, you know, areas where uh, these microbes can grow, reproduce, and if a uh, predatory or negative species shows up, and it's already an environment that's full and balanced, we're probably not going to have uh, as much success as if it comes to a blank slate, uh, you know, a soil that is, you know, devoid of microbial life. Uh, so all these things make focusing on microbes important. And we're not going to go too great in depth on this because I do want to try to get through several topics tonight, but it is something to understand that a healthy soil is also microbiologically active. And so if you say, well, what's one thing we can do for healthy soils? Number one off the top, add organic matter. So what is organic matter? And notice this is little o organic matter, meaning this is not a label. This is just saying materials that were once alive uh, are added to the soil. So it's carbon rich materials, but they also have all sorts of other nutrients. So there's a few ways we can do this. One that doesn't get used as much in home gardens as probably it could, or maybe even should, is cover crops or green manures. So a cover crop or a green manure is where you're growing plants not to harvest them, but to improve the soil. So typically uh, these are killed in some manner, whether they're mowed, whether they're plowed under. Uh, in conventional agriculture, cover crops are used a lot and they're often killed by uh, non-selective herbicide use. Uh, so certainly, but then what happens is as these materials uh, begin to break down as they're incorporated into the soil, we get all the benefits of the nutrients uh, as well as uh, the carbon adding to that soil. One thing that I think is important to say, and I didn't bring this out on the slide and perhaps I should have, um, we never wanna have bare soils. Uh, so bare soils, meaning nothing living or no mulch on the soil uh, is prone to movement. So whether we're talking about erosion where we're having it move. Uh, but also what happens is, believe it or not, bare soils do not allow as much water to infiltrate as soils that have plants growing on it. Soils will crust and that actually causes water to run off, uh, which can sometimes be a problem in and of itself. Um, but when we have things growing on our soil, we actually have more water getting into the soil. So it's kind of counterintuitive. And there certainly is kind of a tradition where people will plow in the fall or early winter and leave their gardens bare uh, throughout the winter. That's really not a best practice. We wouldn't recommend that. Uh, and again, that's because bare soils are not uh, doing anything good for either the soil itself and certainly not the biological community. We can also add organic, uh, excuse me, uh, animal manures to our soils. Um, there is a big caveat with this. Um, if you subscribe to my home gardening newsletter uh, a couple of years ago, I had a long lengthy article in there about persistent herbicides, either in haze or in animal manures. And, and essentially what happens is an herbicide is applied to the field where the hay or uh, the pasture where an animal is grazing. The animal consumes the plant that has been treated by the herbicide. It passes through their digestive system and we can still find uh, high enough quantities of the herbicide in their manure to actually affect plants. We commonly see tomatoes and green beans affected because they're more sensitive to the class of herbicides than some other plants. Um, but certainly this is a problem that pops up uh, from time to time. So I always tell people, if you're using animal manures, be very certain um, it's a source that you can have a conversation about where did the forage come from, whether pasture or hay, and do they know what class of herbicides uh, were uh, actually applied to those fields? Um, so just be aware of that. Uh, compost is certainly an option. And compost can include manures or not. It doesn't always. There certainly can be compost that is just vegetative matter and has no animal byproducts in it. Uh, but compost can be added. Uh, it's partially broken down. There's some level of nutrients quickly available, which is good. But again, you're adding that organic matter to the soil. 
One way we can add organic matter and actually get several different benefits from it is uh, using organic materials as mulches. So things like straw, hay, wood chips. I will say hay sometimes we have to be a little careful with because hay can be a source of weed seed sometimes. Straw sometimes can be a source of weed seed if it wasn't actually um, processed well to where the wheat seeds themselves, the grain wasn't fully removed. So it's not uncommon uh, to hear people complain or see a picture on the internet where someone used straw in a garden and you have all these grass seedlings. Well, it's technically a grass, but it's actually just wheat that was contained within that straw bale. Uh, so there are some caveats to using these, but certainly the reason these are good is mulches um, reduce uh, the ability for weeds to grow. It's blocking sunlight to the soil. It lowers temperature during the highest temperature period. So like during summer, it helps soil stay moist uh, more evenly. So even outside of the organic matter factor, I would tell you mulches are great to use in our gardens. Uh, but because they're also composed of organic matter, they're going to be enriching that soil and that microbial community as they break down. So they're great to use in the garden said this before, it releases those nutrients as it decomposes. Quite literally, those microbes are eating it, consuming it, so it's a source of energy as well as materials they need for replication. It does increase the nutrient and water holding capacity of the soil. The way I always think of it is when I add organic matter to the soil, I'm adding in shelving units, and that's letting me have more places for nutrients to sit as well as water, both of which are a wind for us, and it does feed that microbial community. So there's really almost no scenario where we wouldn't uh, advise adding organic matter to our soils. People complain about heavy clays and things like that. One way to help improve how they work, add organic matter. Uh, so certainly uh, it's a key takeaway from this evening. Another thing we can do is actually preserve what organic matter we have. So it's not uh, unusual that if someone converts an area that's been in grass for you know years and years, whether it's a pasture or a yard, they till it, they plow it, and that first year they have a pretty good yield. It does pretty well. Well, what happens is grassy areas actually deposit a lot of organic matter. It's the nature of how grasses grow. Uh, they're adding not just their above ground biomass that we see, but also their roots are adding to the organic matter of the soil. So very often you can have quite a bit of nutrition stored in that soil as organic matter. And we come through and we till or plow it, we uh, basically speed up its decomposition. And so it becomes available. So that first year we have a good crop. The next year, if we're not careful, if we're not adding fertility, we have pretty lousy crop. So what happens when we till or plow either one, basically we are speeding the decomposition of organic matter. So if we can avoid uh, plowing or tilling to the extent that it's possible, it can benefit the soil by preserving that organic matter. Quite literally, one of the results of working the soil is we're chopping things up into smaller pieces, and that absolutely uh, increases the speed at which these various decomposition things happen. So it doesn't mean we can't use uh, tillage or plowing, especially when we're establishing new beds, but it does mean that maybe we should ask, is it a necessity every time we want to till or plow? Certainly mechanical weed control can work, uh, but maybe using mulch instead of repeated tilling for mechanical weed control, for instance, may be a better option. So looking back, uh, we'll go ahead and jump to uh, healthy plants. And so really healthy plants, it's sort of the right plants in the right place at the right time. Uh, and the reason we want healthy plants is just like with ourselves, when we're healthy, we have better resistance against any sort of illness or anything that may be wrong with us. Plants are exactly the same way. So what we would like to do, uh, and again, you know, if we're trying to stack the deck in our favor, we would like to plant resistant varieties wherever possible. So if you've ever looked in catalogs or on tags uh, at the garden center, if you've ever seen tomatoes with a bunch of letters, TV, and, you know, a few others, those different letters after the variety name typically uh, are actually different diseases for which that plant is resistant to. And so certainly uh, there's a whole host of different uh, 
plants out there. It's not just tomatoes, uh, but other things as well that have uh, resistance to both. Uh, primarily, it, we see more marketing on the disease side rather than insect side, but certainly uh, there are some plants that may be more or less susceptible to uh, insects as well. And so if we can start by planting uh, varieties that do have that resistance, that helps gives us uh, a, a benefit in our column. Because quite simply, a resistant variety doesn't mean that it cannot get sick, but given that the uh, disease, for instance, is there, it is less likely to become infected. And so that that is certainly a leg up to begin with. We also want to make sure that we're looking at varieties uh, that are adapted to our climate. And so sometimes this is a little bit of a challenge. Um, certainly, uh, I've really liked looking at all the different seed catalogs and going to the websites of the different companies. And there's a tremendous number of companies in the West Coast area, both, uh, you know, Northwest as well as, you know, in the more Southern areas. Uh, even in the Northeast, there are a number of different uh, seed companies. That being said, not every variety they offer is going to perform well in the southeast where we are. And the southeast seems to have fewer uh, seed companies uh, that are located here. And the reason being our environment is very different. We have high humidity, high temperatures, both of which are certainly different than the Pacific Northwest or the Northeast uh, section of the U.S. So just understand sometimes that varieties that perform very well elsewhere may not hold up as well here simply because we do have a different climate. That being said, there are a lot of varieties that do perform well no matter what environment they're put into. There's a lot of breeding work that happens, but just be aware that sometimes we can have some that perform better than others. And we really want to do our best to provide for the needs of the plant. It goes without saying, uh, fertility and water are both big needs. Also, even sunlight, you know, our gardens are going to benefit by being in full sun. That is to say at least six hours of sun during the day. Um, and really, the more we can give it, the more they like it. Because remember, sunlight is what powers the photosynthesis within the plants, which is how they get the energy. And the more energy they have to grow, the more yield we're going to get out of them, and even the more they're able to defend themselves, because plants do have the ability to defend themselves. And so when we give them healthy starts, uh, it's a great way to enhance that. We do have a good publication uh, from the University of Tennessee. Uh, it's actually based on home garden variety trials. So each year uh, they release um, and offer uh, for a citizen science project where individuals across the state uh, can come in and uh, basically trial in their home gardens some varieties. So basically you get pairs of different varieties. Uh, they typically do kind of sell out. Uh, they're sold at a very modest cost to folks uh, and they do sell out. So it's something I think that they're having great success with over the past several years. So I'm sure it's going to continue and hopefully they'll expand it uh, so it's available to more folks. Uh, but what's great about it is those citizen science projects, those trials, have allowed them to compile a list of varieties that actually have been evaluated by home gardeners. And that way they can actually um, have a, you know, a opinion on what's doing well in the state of Tennessee. And, and so I think this is a, a really valuable uh, resource for us and one that's going to be included in the list of resources that you'll receive after uh, the class is over. When it comes to timing, and this one's pretty straightforward, it's not one that I think uh, is too difficult for experienced gardeners, uh, but uh, when we plant things. And, and so certainly, um, if you're in the Northeast Tennessee area, I hope you don't have your tomatoes and uh, peppers out yet in your garden, because it's really early. Uh, we're... I like to be kind of safe and say around May 1st is our uh, date for putting out those warm season things. Certainly peppers being a little bit more tropical than tomatoes, we could even wait until after the first week of May if we wanted to be cautious. Uh, but certainly we're still early. There's entirely the likelihood of a frost happening. And the truth is it's not just about if we may or may not have a frost, it's also things like soil temperature. So even if our air temperature is maybe warm enough that it's not gonna be a problem for some of our warm season crops, 
the soil temperature always lags or, or falls behind the rise in air temperature. Uh, so waiting later until we know we have sufficiently warm soils and we're away from frost threats is always a benefit to us. Another thing, and I just kind of uh, cut out a, a little section of this chart from, again, a publication you'll be receiving a link to, the ability to plant for fall in our region. So we actually have a number of different crops that do very well as fall crops uh, to some extent. In some instances, I think they may perform better as fall crops than in the spring. Uh, our brassicas or coal crops, things like, uh, you know, uh, cabbage and broccoli and all that family can all benefit from not only early spring plantings because they tolerate the cool timbers but also a fall garden where we may be planting in you know anywhere from august to september in our region and carrying them through the cold weather because they don't have problems with those cooler temperatures uh, and so certainly take advantage of that because one allows us to extend our garden season uh, but also to uh, especially with something like broccoli that i have seen where um, a commercial field has been planted going along great and about a week before harvest in the spring we get a week in late may of 90 degree weather and those floral buds that we're eating in that broccoli just start opening up. And so it goes to flower. And of course, then the crop is lost. Uh, typically, we don't see things like that happen with our fall crops. Uh, so certainly, I think fall crops are something that if you've never done before, think about it. We'll probably do another uh, class or webinar on fall gardens this year. We've done the past couple of years pretty well attended because I do think it's something that a lot of gardeners maybe don't do. And sometimes it fits in better with schedules. If you know you're going to be gone on summer vacation and some things like that, sometimes doing something later in the year actually works better. So just consider that and look at the resources available. I also want to mention, and I, start, I said this much earlier, you know, organic agriculture is not the lack of utilizing inputs. So things like fertilizers or pest control products like insecticides or fungicides, uh, certainly, you know, organic crops uh, can still get the same exact pests that we see with conventional crops. Uh, and there are times when we need to use pest control products. And we do have those available in some instances. Sometimes we don't have great organic options. Um, other times we have some excellent products. But certainly the judicious use of inputs, so doing things like soil testing, you know, every three to five years in our home garden, just to get a snapshot of what fertility looks like. That way we know, you know, are we mining our soils where we're removing more fertility when we make our harvest than we're putting back in, which we really don't want to have happen? Or are we doing a good job maintaining that fertility? So certainly just understand we can use these products. Uh, and in truth, if we don't use these products, we're probably not going to have great success. So certainly, uh, if you are very committed to doing organic gardening, uh, you may ask, well, what products are actually, you know, approved for use in commercial operations? What meet that USDA definition? There's a couple good resources for this. Probably the one that's most accessible to homeowners to both to purchase as well as to review online is actually the Organic Materials Review Institute or OMRI. You see their green logo there on your screen. That is something that you will find often on retail products. Uh, so if you go to the big box store, if you go to the farm store, they will be actually be carrying products that has this label. Uh, sometimes I hear people refer to this as certification. Omri doesn't give a certification. What Omri does is they're actually a 501c3. They're a nonprofit that reviews products and makes a determination as to whether or not they comply with the regulations. Can they be used uh, in the production of a certified organic product? Uh, and so if it is an OMRI labeled product, uh, you can actually use it if you're a certified farm. So certainly a home gardener would be safe in using it. So it's not just uh, pest control products, it's fertilizers, it's potting soils, it's any number of different things. Uh, so understand that that label is one that you can always know uh, would be approved. The other two logos you see there, the kind of three leaf logo. Uh, that is actually a designation from the EPA or the Environmental Protection Agency. 
The EPA actually regulates all pesticides. And so, and even organic pesticides are regulated. And so when you see that three leaf logo and it can have a couple of different statements after it, you can see for organic production, you can see for organic gardening, but that three leaf logo, even absent that statement is actually uh, an endorsement or approval that the EPA has regarded that this product is eligible for use by certified operations. So again, this is one that we know would be good uh, and approved for organic operations. And so certainly a home garden could use it. Talking some specifics about different fertility type products that may be used in organic systems. Uh, you know, by and large, we see things like compost and manures often used. Uh, sometimes these are processed, so that may be a pelleted chicken litter, for instance. So chicken litter that has come out of a poultry operation, it may be heat treated, uh, it gets processed, turned into pellets or granules, so it's more easily spread. Uh, some things are derived from uh, products such as kelp uh, or fish emulsion, uh, which is to say kind of all the different parts of fish that we don't really utilize much in the food chain, uh, but they can be turned into a fertilizer product. They may be plant-based. So certainly there are products like alfalfa meal or soybean meal uh, that could be used for organic fertility. And even wood ash to a very small extent, I think more in a backyard garden scenario rather than commercial, but any of those could be used. Um, I will also mention, just as a note, many of these products are also adding organic matter at the same time, which we already have talked about is a good thing. One thing I do want to make you available or, or aware of is earlier I said, you know, by and large, synthetics are disallowed. Um, there are some carve outs and some very specific carve outs. So if you get digging into the regulations, you will actually find where there are some synthetics allowed. And for instance, with crop production, which is where we would have a, a, a vegetable garden fall under, uh, there are uh, allowances for things such as utilizing plastic mulch, which plastic, of course, is synthetic, uh, but also some things like magnesium sulfate, or we probably know it better as Epsom salt. Uh, elemental sulfur, which is what we would use to lower pH, make it more acidic. So if you were planning on doing blueberries, uh, we would do a soil test and give you a recommendation to lower that pH down to an acceptable level by utilizing elemental sulfur. So that would be approved. There are some micronutrients that because of how they're derived, they would be regarded as a synthetic product. And so they're actually allowed as well. And even the fish emulsion products, because they have acid that is added to them for adjusting the pH, they would technically be regarded as a uh, synthetic material too, because they have uh, been added to. Um, so there are some synthetics allowed. It is very minimal, but just be aware that does exist. I do want to mention one thing about manure use, and it's about food safety. So what we need to understand is that manure can always be a potential source of pathogenic microbes or, or those microbes that could attack humans. So things like E. coli, salmonella, um, and others uh, can be found in manure. Because there is that possibility within the organic regulations, uh, there's a specific rule. It's found at 205-203-C, uh, and specifically, we kind of refer to it as the 90 and 120 day rule. And what it says is that if you have a crop where there's direct contact with the harvested portion and soil, the latest you could apply manure to that soil and incorporate it would be 120 days prior to harvest. If you have a crop where the harvested portion is above the soil, there is no direct contact expected, then you could apply and incorporate manure 90 days prior to harvest. And so, you know, an example, cantaloupe, for instance, direct contact with the soil, um, sweet corn would be a perfect example of an elevated crop that does not have that direct contact.
And so actually right now, currently, there's some um, regulations that affect commercial growers, um, the Food Safety Modernization Act, and specifically the section, the Produce Safety Rule. Uh, and it right now is currently utilizing this as their suggested uh, interval for the use of manure. Uh, so this is uh, something that has a good history uh, of having positive outcomes. Uh, and it's something that currently in the world of food safety is observed as the best that we have to offer. So certainly if we're using uncomposted manures, and I will say this, within the organic regulations, composted manures have a very specific definition about the number of turnings that happen, the temperatures that are reached, and how long the temperatures are maintained. Um, and I will say it is highly unusual that a backyard gardener's compost pile would reach those temperatures. So if you're adding manures to your compost pile, I would probably still follow the 90 and 120 day rule, just out of an abundance of caution. Uh, and uh, I would definitely try to maximize that time between application and then the harvest of product. So just be aware of that. I will say that there is kind of one caveat or negative associated with a lot of these organic fertility products, and that's that they first must be acted upon by that microbiological community before the nutrients are released to the plant. And so the downside is this takes time. It's good that we're feeding that microbiological community, but it does take time and it is particularly uh, slowed during periods of cool soil temperatures. So early in like the spring season when our soil temperatures are still slow, these processes are gonna be going slower. And so just something to understand that, you know, typically when you're utilizing these products, there may be some uh, percentage of their content that is rapidly available, but by and large, it takes time. So you're not necessarily gonna see an immediate effect. The good thing is because it takes time, that means these act kind of like natural slow release fertilizers. So they're actually contributing to the available nutrition over a period of time, which is good. We just have to understand that it does take time for that to happen. So integrated pest management. So IPM, it's a nice big cluster of words. And if I had to shorten it, it would basically say before we reach for pesticides uh, to control any pest, we do other things first. And so it can be cultural or biological controls that we do in our gardens. One thing that's real valuable to uh, production agriculture is the establishment of thresholds, which basically is to say counts. So if you're a farmer and you have to go out there and apply a product, it's gonna cost you money first to purchase the product and even that physical act of applying it. And so what has happened for a lot of crops is we have very specific thresholds where there may be uh, pheromone traps used for instance, uh, and then you count the number of moths that are caught. And then based off the number of moths, you make a decision, do we actually treat for a pest or not? Uh, and it's well understood in those scenarios. The bad thing is we don't really have good thresholds or counts we can provide to you for that backyard garden. Totally different environment uh, than the field level that we see with commercial production. But the ideal is still there and we'll mention it later. The other thing that's critical to integrated pest management is monitoring or inspection of our plants. And so how do we know we have a pest problem? we're looking for it. And we're not just looking at the plants from the top. We're looking down in the leaf worlds. We're looking on the underside of leaves. Think about especially insect pests. There's a lot of things that like to eat insects. And so they basically naturally want to hide when they're out in the environment. Um, and that means they're on the underside of leaves. They are clustered in whorls of leaves. If we just casually glance at plants looking for insects, we will very often miss them, even though we may have a significant infestation of aphids, for instance. But if we start turning over leaves, then we start finding those insects. So monitoring and inspection in our home gardens is important because when it's just a few, it's much easier to control. We're gonna have better results if we are utilizing a control product or if we're doing something more physical like hand picking, 
we're going to be more successful with that simply because there's fewer there. If we learn to recognize different egg clusters, so is this the eggs of an insect that's beneficial to our garden, or is this the insect of a, a pest species? Very important because knowing what's happening out there allows us to make decisions. And if we don't know, then we're either asking for a problem to develop or we're going to be doing control things and wasting our efforts. So to me, when it comes to the home garden, we don't have good numerical thresholds, but one of the things I always consider is, does our produce that we're consuming ourselves at home need to be cosmetically perfect? Uh, certainly, if it's something that's going to market, uh, we are looking for a product that looks very nice. Uh, commercial operations have very exacting standards applied to the product they supply uh, to grocery stores, for instance. Uh, and so, you know, they don't have the chores. Home gardeners, if there's a blemish, you know, and it's a cosmetic issue, it's not going to hurt your enjoyment of it. It's certainly not going to harm you in any way. So I think we have a little bit greater tolerance for there to be some damage in our gardens. That doesn't mean we should ignore pests, but I think it does mean we need to put it in context. Is this a pest or a level of infestation that is going to actually kill this crop? Or is it just going to make it look a little ugly to us? If it's just a little ugly, we may be able just to allow things to um, continue naturally and hopefully reach a balance through like, uh, for instance, with some insects, maybe a beneficial insect that's going to eat them. Uh, so certainly, I think understanding what our personal threshold is for action is a good ideal. Cultural controls, there's a number of different things we can do. One of the ones, especially when we're talking about diseased plants, if we see a plant that is exhibiting symptoms of being diseased, we can remove it from the garden. That's one of the best things. Diseased plants are never going to yield well. And what's worse, they can be the source of the disease for new infections and in other plants we're growing. So certainly removing diseased plants is a great idea. We wouldn't want to put a diseased plant into our compost pile because, again, if we're not getting high enough temperatures, we're just inoculating that compost with the pest. And so that means when we use that compost later, we could be providing that disease to those other plants. Crop rotations are something that is always advised, whether organic or conventionals. And basically, this just says that when we are growing plants, we're going to rotate among plant families. The reason we do that is multiple. Uh, among them would be one, typically uh, plants in the same family have similar nutritional needs. So if we grow the same thing in the same plot time after time, we're going to be becoming deficient possibly in some nutrients. Additionally, uh, we see that when we grow the same plants or families in, of plants in the same place, we do get a buildup of disease and insects because those disease and insects, some of them overwinter despite our best control efforts. And so that means there's a jump start of the population on the next season. And so by rotating among different crop families and one of the resources you will receive is a link to uh, different crop families that we do grow so you can understand that better. Uh, rotating where we're planting those physically in the garden uh, is a good strategy. It's going to support everything else we do. We can certainly use physical controls, so things like excluding them by the use of floating row covers. You know, if you're growing blueberries and you're having birds eat your blueberries or your cherries, netting can be highly effective. It can be a challenge and a pain to deal with. Uh, but, you know, there's really not another cultural control or chemical control out there that's going to give us any success. Uh, so sometimes it's the last resort, but it works well. Certainly fencing can keep out, you know, maybe some uh, deer or rabbits or something like that. Certainly the quality of the fence is important. Deer can jump a rather high fence. Rabbits can squeak through a lot of small spaces, but certainly physical exclusion can work. And hand removal, I mentioned it early, especially in a small garden, sometimes that can work really well when we have uh, insect and we realize it, we can just remove it. You can even remove an infected leaf, for instance. So if there's a leaf spot or something on a leaf, we can just remove that from the garden and possibly prevent the spread of it. Uh, so, you know, removal just by hand can often be a good control strategy. One of the things that's 
a good idea to do and is that's to avoid using broad spectrum insecticides except when they must be used. Now this would include some organic insecticides simply because we have an organic product that doesn't mean uh, that it doesn't have the ability to harm beneficial species. And so I think that's important. Organic insecticides or pesticides in general are no different than their conventional ones in that we need to use them appropriately. Broad spectrum means it's not a specific action. It's not targeting a specific um, species or a class of insects. Uh, and so when we use it, we can negatively impact off target species. So that means we could be hurting uh, pollinators, for instance, or we could be uh, hurting uh, predatory insects that would eat bad insects. So just understanding that the broader spectrum an insecticide is, the greater likelihood we may have off-target impacts that we don't intend to have. One of the things that, you know, specifically was mentioned in that USDA definition was biodiversity. And so certainly creating habitat that encourages beneficial species and certainly insects pop to everybody's mind when we talk about gardens, when you think about pollinators, but even birds are going to consume uh, any number of certain uh, pest species, toads and frogs. Again, they will eat pests. Uh, even reptiles, so lizards and snakes, uh, you know, garter snakes, things like that, they largely eat snugs and snails and insects of various kinds, uh, and even beneficial insects themselves. By having environment that allows them to grow and thrive uh, can offer that balancing act. So if we have a rise in the pest population, we hope to have a rise in that beneficial population that will consume them. And then we reach, a, a, again, a balance. Uh, so some of the methods we can utilize to do this, planting flowering plants, uh, providing habitats such as birdhouses, allowing standing dead trees to remain where they're not a hazard, where they're not going to fall and harm something or someone, uh, or creating bee hotels. And I think there's a really good publication from University of Michigan uh, that you see there in the bottom corner, you'll get as part of your resources, really talks about a great way to do this for various wild bee species, uh, some of which can be predatory, others are just pollinators, but certainly something that's beneficial to have in our gardens. Mentioned this at the very beginning, reading and following all label directions when it comes to pesticide use is absolutely a must because even organic pesticides can result in harm when not used appropriately. It can be harm to an individual. It could be harm to the environment. Uh, certainly there are products that, for instance, if used incorrectly can harm pollinators. So we have to be aware that organic insecticides are not to be used without an appropriate level of caution. And we understand what we need to do when we read that label. Also be aware, this primarily wouldn't apply to most organic products. Most organic products do not have a pre-harvest interval. But what a pre-harvest interval is, the last day you can use a product prior to harvest. So there are any number of organic uh, pesticide products that can be used that can be used up to the day of harvest. And one thing I will say, haven't done at this point, but when I say pesticide, that's a very large umbrella term. And pesticide basically is just a product that kills something else. Under pesticides, you have things like insecticides, you have fungicides, which kill funguses, you have bactericides that kill bacteria, you can have miticides that kill mites on plants, and so on. So pesticide is a very broad spectrum term, and it includes a number of different products. Um, probably should have said that earlier, but I'm happy to get that in here. Uh, certainly, uh, one caveat to these organic products is they don't have residual activity, and it comes uh, about because of the mode of action. So most of these products, particularly the insecticides, are only effective when they directly contact the pest species. So that means if you're spraying for aphids, you have to literally physically hit the aphid with the product direct contact. What that also means is the aphid that shows up tomorrow after you sprayed today 
is it going to be impacted because that product's already dried and it's no longer an active control agent. So that means it's critically important when you use these products that they're actually getting to where that pest is. So again, the underside of leaves, when you have those leaf whorls and things like that, you have to be getting that control product in direct contact with the insect. And sometimes that's easier said than done. So just be aware of that a great product that's not applied well will yield very little control. And so these are sensitive with how they're applied and that direct contact is important. Also, because there's no residual activity, it doesn't, you know, again, control after it's sprayed. Um, you're gonna have more frequent applications than you would with conventional products. So just be aware of that. Typically, your label will give you directions as to what would be an appropriate time period uh, and, and just make sure that you follow that. One thing I do like to mention anytime I'm talking about gardening, um, there's any number of home remedies or homemade pesticides. Certainly, the Internet uh, makes them easily available to us. I would encourage you not to use those. Uh, one they're not going to be organic typically. Uh, so if you are concerned with organic production, that would be something to be aware of. But the efficacy is at least questionable. And certainly, uh, you know, how much of the product do you use to have effective control? We don't know. It's not a labeled product. There's not specific directions. And so I just think that, you know, avoid homemade pesticides, uh, results in either, uh, you know, a failure of control because the product simply doesn't work or maybe unintended consequences because a lot of these products will, for instance, talk about utilizing uh, various soaps or detergents and things like that. And while there are insecticidal soaps, there are very specific chemical-based products and they don't act the same way as dish detergent does. And so because of that, we can actually harm plants by utilizing household, you know, soaps or dish detergents. So I'd encourage you not to make your own pesticides, but only use labeled products. I did want to just kind of briefly look at some commonly available uh, products on the marketplace. Uh, these specifically are insecticides, and we should also say miticides with this statement. And these are again coming out of one of the publications you're going to get from me. Um, but basically, you know, there are any number of different products that can be used. Um, one of the challenges with organic recommendations, though, is that efficacy is not always known well. And so some of these products haven't had the research behind them that others have. And so certainly I think that, you know, simply because a product may be even approved for organic agriculture doesn't necessarily mean it's highly effective. And so uh, just be aware of that uh, and understand that there could be a lack of control, even if you're doing a good job. Um, and so certainly some of these products uh, are very commonly used. Um, BT, so the second listing there, the second row, Bacillus thuringiensis, or BT products, we commonly see them referred to. Highly effective products at controlling caterpillars, which are the larval stage of moths and butterflies, particularly very useful on the brassica family. Uh, to prevent um, cabbage looper and related worms, but also in tomatoes with the hornworm or fruit worm. Um, one thing to understand about these products is they have to be eaten by that caterpillar. So this is one that you can spray them with the product, not going to harm them. They have to physically ingest it. So we're spraying it on the underside of leaves and places like that where they like to hide out and where they're eating. And when they eat, the BT, they'll die within a few days. Otherwise, it doesn't do anything on them. So again, dousing them with it isn't going to help you. Putting it in um, irrigation water isn't going to help you. They have to consume it directly off that leaf surface whenever they're biting the leaves. Uh, so just understand that that application is important. It works best on smaller caterpillars. So again, you know, when you start seeing those white uh, 
uh, moths flying in the cabbage patch, that's when you know you need to start spraying a BT spray uh, to control those cabbage loopers. Horticultural oils are something that's used in a lot of crops, tree fruits, for instance. Um, one big caveat with them is the temperature at which they can be used. When you have high temperatures, uh, you do have uh, potential for there to be negative or phytotoxic effects on the plant. So just be aware of that and make sure if it's a bright sunny day that you probably wouldn't want to use those. So again, follow those label directions. Insecticidal soaps I mentioned earlier uh, can do very well must have direct contact. And sometimes we use some of these even, you know, in uh, indoors for house plants because as far as quote unquote chemicals, they're really not, uh, you know, something that has negative aspects to them. Certainly I wouldn't want to eat anything. Uh, you know, I'm not going to turn up a jug of insecticidal soap, but uh, completely compared to some products that might be used, uh, certainly much friendlier in an environment where we know there's going to be close contact with people. Uh, clarified neem oil, and I skipped the very top row, and you may have noticed that. Uh, basically, they're both related. So uh, the top row of, and let me see if I can say this correctly, uh, as a direct and uh, is actually a chemical that is found within the neem plant. And so it acts as an anti-feedant, so it stops things from eating, as well as an insect growth regulator. So it can actually interfere with the development of insect pests. Um, clarified neem oil itself, however, is actually more like a horticultural oil in that it's had that uh, as a redactant actually removed from it. So it's more of the smothering physical control that we see with horticultural oils. And so uh, just be aware that if you're wanting the anti-feeding and insect growth regulator, don't choose clarified neem oil, which has had that removed. Pyrethrins are actually derived from uh, basically a type of chrysanthemum. And there's actually a whole host of synthetic pyrethroids on the market that are used in conventional agriculture. So these are effective. Some of these can actually be rather expensive sometimes. So in commercial uh, organic agriculture, mm. this is one caveat with uh, some of those products is that they come with a high uh, cost. So it's not something that a lot of commercial producers necessarily run to, but they can directly impact things like pollinators. And so this is one that if you're using pyrethrins, understand that you're going to be wanting to use these uh, when we don't have pollinators uh, visiting plants. So using them at dusk in the evening, uh, if it is a flowering plant, uh, is a good uh, step to take. There's also some combination products that are pyrethrins with insecticidal soaps. And then there's also uh, products uh, that are uh, I have the active ingredient of spinosad. Uh, these work good on a pretty broad range and then it has a very typically broad label. So we're not just using it in the vegetable garden. There's also ornamental uses as well. So again, this is gonna be product uh, that you can review later in the publication. With disease prevention, very similar. Uh, one, we can see that there's actually uh, bacteria products that we would spray on plants. Uh, these are basically bacteria that don't harm the plant directly and certainly don't harm us. And it's kind of basically filling that niche so that when a pest species show up, it's not going to find a place to live because someone's already there. Uh, copper is a good bacteria side, also has some fungal activity, works very well on a number of different um, diseases. The publication uh, will have, and you can note in the third column over, where you see small notation after the different diseases. This is referencing the efficacy as reported in research. Uh, and so this will tell you whether it's a very good product for that or maybe had less uh, control than uh, they would have liked. Uh, neem oil, again, we have uh, listed because neem oil itself 
um, can actually be a good fungicide. So that's one of the benefits of utilizing some neem oil products is that they have both good activity as uh, a fungicide or disease control agent, as well as some insecticidal control. Potassium bicarbonate, and this is not baking soda, which is sodium bicarbonate, uh, but potassium bicarbonate uh, is one that does have some good activity, especially with uh, various fungal uh, leaf diseases. Again, uh, always pay attention to uh, label directions, making sure that, you know, for instance, the crop we're growing is actually listed. There's also another uh, living bacteria listed there, Streptomyces. Uh, this one, again, is kind of suppressing or taking that spot uh, that uh, the negative uh, bacteria such as Pythium, Phytophthora, Fusarium, Rhizoctonia, or others can take. So again, it's kind of you're inoculating uh, your plant with um, a species that doesn't cause harm to prevent the other one from invading. And then another product that has a long history of use of disease control is sulfur. Uh, and sulfur certainly does have some good um, uh, disease control aspects. There are some products that will mix uh, sulfur with insecticides. If you run across those, just understand because there's now the insecticide included with it, we have to be careful again about pollinators. So again, that pyrethrin uh, caveat would pop back up again. But again, the label should inform you about that. And so the bottom line, when it comes to organic agriculture or our organic gardening, what we're looking at doing is creating a system where we have a fostering of the cycling of resources. So it's not just always headed out of the garden. We're putting things back in there through different amendments, uh, different fertilizers so that we always maintain good fertility for our gardens. We're promoting ecological balance. So that means we have flowering plants, maybe not directly in the garden itself, but certainly within the larger environment of the garden, you know, within the yard or something like that. Um, sometimes a great way to do this can actually be including flowering trees in our land landscapes. Uh, so it doesn't necessarily have to be just bedding plants, you know, during the summer or something like that. But we provide habitat that encourages, you know, an ecological balance where uh, we hope that when we have pest species rise, we also see a rise in the beneficial populations. And we do conserve that biodiversity. So whenever possible, we're doing things in our larger garden environment that enhances uh, the ability for other species to coexist with us. And I'll just say that, you know, when it comes down to it, probably very few home gardeners strictly follow the regulations of organic production. And I think that's perfectly acceptable. Everyone's going to come up with their own version of what organic gardening looks like. And just because it doesn't meet the exact definition, I still think it's doing well because you're taking an opportunity to focus on how can you enhance your garden and, you know, maybe do so in a way that does have uh, this positive, more sustainable aspect to it than just immediately reaching for a pest control product. So certainly, I appreciate everyone joining us tonight. And with that, I'll pause for questions. And right now, I'm going to stop the recording.